Dear colleague, welcome to this overview of a surgery in ancient Egypt. I have written quite a lot regarding the history of tactic and functional neurosurgery. However, many years ago, I started my studies in archaeology before turning to medicine. And it is always interesting to apply a wider perspective why some years ago I decided to analyze the history of surgery from its very beginning and I found it natural to start with ancient Egypt. After having read about 1200 books and papers related to this topic, I found myself quite confused. Much has been written, but many details are unclear and many claims are difficult to substantiate. For that reason, I have created this overview. The presentation is based on seven of my publications and some unpublished manuscripts. Please consult these for more detailed information and references. We will here deal with surgery in Pharaonic Egypt. It is important to realize that this covers a very long period of time and that the Egyptian society, although conservative, was not static but changed over time. We will not cover the later periods when Egypt was under Persian, Greek and Roman rule and thus belonged to a different cultural sphere. Already at the time of the merging of the upper and lower kingdoms around 3200 BC, an advanced society existed in Egypt, and the birth of the old kingdom around 2686 BC would result in significant achievements in many fields, such as art, architecture, social and engineering, and medicine. Medicine and surgery can be said to be at least as old as humankind, but in a more organized form, medicine as an art might be said to have first seen the light of day in Egypt. At least this was the opinion of the Egyptians themselves, according to Pliny the Elder. Egyptian medicine was also well respected among its neighbors, and Egyptian doctors were sought after by foreign rulers. This high regard for the ancient Egyptians has persisted through the ages, and the Napoleonic expedition to Egypt at the end of the 18th century contributed considerably to the interest, admiration, and not least to the romantic air surrounding the alleged skills of the ancient Egyptians. However, even if Egypt might be considered as the cradle of medicine, the modern literature is sometimes too enthusiastic. This is perhaps most noticeable regarding the surgical skills which have been attributed to the Egyptians. Often one can follow how a statement has been spread through the scientific literature, evolving through the generations every time it is repeated until it has become something completely new, without foundation in the original sources. This problem is enhanced by the fact that many surgeons with limited historical training are interested in this topic, while most Egyptologists have a limited understanding of and especially a limited interest in surgery. Thus, while there are many sober scholar works on medicine in ancient Egypt of a high quality, the field of surgery is to a large extent covered in papers of a less sober nature and of a not too impressive quality. Therefore, we will in this lecture to a large extent have to focus on what the ancient Egyptians did not do, rather than on what they actually did. It is clear that there were many physicians in Egypt, and the names of about 150 of them has been preserved to posterity. Several different subspecialities are mentioned, like oculist and dentist. However, even if it is often claimed in modern publications that surgery was one of these, this has no support in the sources. There is nothing suggesting that surgery was a field separated from medicine in general. This is hardly surprising, considering the limited number of procedures and their simplicity. Several different titles existed, but the most common was Sunu, the hieroglyphs of this word have sometimes been interpreted in an ideogrammatic manner. 
Earlier, they were suggested to consist of a bisturi and a mortar, or interpreted as symbolizing a medicine pot and the doctor's ability of extracting arrows. Today it is known to be formed by an arrow and a waist, and these signs are here purely phonetic. It has often been suggested that the Sunu would have been equal to physicians, while the Wab priest of Sashmet were those who performed surgical procedures. It seems as if these priests had a role in medicine. However, the identification of them as surgeons is based solely on two extremely weak arguments. The first argument is based on a carving from the 11th dynasty, depicting two priests of Sashmet, where the accompanying text states that they put their hand on the patient, that they thus know what it is, and they are skilled in the examination with the hand. This is of course as attributable to a physician as to a surgeon. The second argument comes from the Papyri Ebers and Edwin Smith. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, the passage of interest is seen here, mentioning first the priest and then the Sunu. In the Ebers papyrus, there is an almost identical passage, but with the reversed order of the priest and the physician. Since the Edwin Smith papyrus deals with surgery, this reversed order was interpreted so that the Edwin Smith papyrus was mostly intended for the priest of Sachmet, who hence must have been surgeons. This argument cannot be taken seriously, especially not considering the context in which these passages appear in the texts. The existence of female surgeons in ancient Egypt has often been stated. We could learn about this on the webpage of the Royal College of Surgeons and on the webpage of the Swedish Surgical Society, where it is, was stated that we know for Egyptian writing and through paintings on Egyptian temples that it was women that were actually providing the majority of medical care and specifically surgical care. Similar opinions have been expressed in the medical literature, where it is often stated that depictions of women surgeons are common in temples and tombs in Egypt. These images are said to present, among other procedures, both caesarean sections and removal of cancerous breasts. It has also been stated that the active role of women in surgery is detailed in surgical text of that time. Unfortunately, there are no such texts or images. There is nothing suggesting the existence of female surgeons in the original sources. These misconceptions are mostly based on the works of Kate Campbell Hurst Mead, who has presented many similar statements, always unsupported by references or with support in the provided references. The most well known of the Egyptian doctors today is Imhotep, popularized in the mummy movies for almost a hundred years. Imhotep has often been identified as the father of medicine and surgery, but unfortunately Imhotep was with all likelihood not a doctor. We first meet the person Imhotep in the beginning of the Old Kingdom, in the 27th century BC, as the Chancellor of Djoser, and supposed architect behind the first pyramid. There are only a few very short inscriptions regarding Imhotep that are close in time, and none of these suggest that he was a physician, or had any medical knowledge. The sources remain scarce for a long period, but he is mentioned as a wise man in a song from the New Kingdom, and later achieves divine status. The earliest health-related reference comes more than 2000 years after his death, during the 30th dynasty in the 4th century BC, where the god Imhotep appears as a divine healer. Over time, the medical aspect becomes more and more pronounced, and the Greeks identified him with Asclepius. Later, the delineation between the man and the god of medicine becomes unclear, and we then meet the man Imhotep in the Greek Hermetic literature as the first inventor of medicine. 
In the modern literature on the Dr. Imhotep, the Egyptica of Maneto, written almost two and a half millennia later in Greek during the Hellenistic era, has been very influential, even though he is never actually mentioned in this work. This is simply based on one of the modern translations where the translator simply inserted the name of Imhotep in the text. We do not know how the Egyptian doctors received their training. In general, it seems as if his sons often acquired the trade of their fathers, and it seems likely that this was common also concerning the medical profession, where several stele have documented the congregation of several doctors within a family, and sons following in the footsteps of their fathers. It has sometimes been stated that the house of life functioned as a medical training facility. However, this has no real support in the sources. The House of Life might probably be described as a learned institution concerned with matters of divine, magic and earthly knowledge. There is no clear connection between the House of Life and the practice of clinical medicine and absolutely nothing suggesting the House of Life to be an institution for teaching. Our knowledge concerning Egyptian surgical instruments is limited. Knives, tweezers, cautery and fire drill are mentioned in the medical papyri. Several instruments in the archaeological material have been suggested as surgical instruments. The circumstances of many of these finds are not known, the dating is often difficult and the datable instruments are most often of a rather late date. These instruments could certainly have been used for surgery and display similarities with known surgical tools from later epochs. However, since these instruments are of a quite general nature, a clear attribution to surgery is not possible, provided that this is not suggested by the context or combination of the find, which unfortunately has not been the case. The famous frieze on the wall of Kom Ombo is often referred to concerning Egyptian surgical instruments. It has, however, beyond any doubt, been demonstrated that this is a late depiction of Roman instruments from the 2nd century uh, AD. A few years ago, the discovery of a set of metal tools in the grave of a Dr. Carr from the 6th dynasty made the headlines. This because they were presented as the world's oldest surgical tools by the well-known Egyptologist Sai Hawass. In reality, these are model instruments that have been found in many graves from that period, regardless of the profession of the buried. And it was already in 1968 specifically pointed out that these are engraving tools and definitely not surgical tools. It seems unlikely that Sai Hawass would not be aware of this, and they are now suitably hosted in the Imhotep Museum. Regarding anatomy, it is often claimed that the surgical skills of ancient Egypt was to a large extent based on their considerable anatomical knowledge. This anatomical knowledge is supposedly demonstrated by their anatomical vocabulary, preserved and lost literary works related to anatomy, the existence of human dissections, and knowledge achieved from the mummifications. It seems unlikely that the mummifications would have markedly improved anatomical knowledge of the Egyptians. Subdermal incisions would have revealed little concerning the underlying muscular anatomy. Piecemeal removal of the brain excluded a gross anatomical view. Removal of abdominal and thoracic organs for a small incision would provide a gross anatomical view of some of the individual organs, but little information regarding their location, relationship and connections beyond what could be learned from animal slaughter. The mummification was clearly more related to slaughter than to the later systematic dissections performed in Alexandria during the Hellenistic era. Perhaps the most important contribution 
uh, of the frequent mummifications might have been to strengthen the understanding of anatomical homology between species, thus strengthening the motivation for contemplating anatomical observations regardless of origin. The Egyptian terms for the brain, spinal cord, cerebral convol convolutions, meninges, heart, lung, diaphragm, kidney, bladder, stomach, bowel and uterus were all written with animal determinatives, thus manifesting their recognition of the homology between human and animal organs, as stated by Cave in 1950. The hieroglyphs themselves are in several cases based directly on animal anatomy, as the sign for throat constituted by the head and trachea of an ox, or the typical bicornuated bovine uterus. One of the first pharaohs, Atotis, sometimes identified with Jir, is said to have practiced medicine and to have written books on anatomy as early as around 3000 BC. Considering that this information stems from the lost Egyptica of Maneto from the 3rd century BC, written almost 3000 years later in Greek during the Hellenistic era, it is probably wise not to put any trust in this statement. According to Maneto, these books were still existent. And 500 years later, Clement of Alexandria mentioned the books of Hermes Trismegistus concerning anatomy and medicine. However, it was common practice in Egypt to provide such works with an ancient origin, not seldom of divine nature. We sometimes meet the unsubstantiated statement that human dissections were performed in pharaonic Egypt. This statement <clears throat> seems to be mostly based on a translation error in an Armenian translation regarding Maneto's text on Atotis. Probably this notion is also influenced by the dissections performed later by Herophilus of Alexandria during the Hellenistic era. Aulus Gellius and Pliny are sometimes referred to regarding Egyptian dissections, but both of them are discussing the Greeks in Egypt during this era. We then arrive at surgery in the archaeological material. Elliot Smith stated many years ago that in 30,000 investigated mummies there were no signs of any surgical procedures and not much have happened since then. However, this is not surprising considering the state of most mummies. Here we see a number of royal mummies in excellent condition. Unfortunately, most mummies are not in this condition. If we take a look at Imhotep's lover from the movie, Anak Sunamun, the years has not treated her kindly. Most mummies are in such poor condition that it would be very difficult to find traces of minor or even of major surgery. Regarding depictions of surgical procedures, there are many depictions said to show surgical procedures. Most of these do not exist or are depicting something else. In reality, we have only two circumcision scenes, one possible removal of a foreign body in the eye and one possible reduction of a dislocated shoulder. This will be further discussed below in relation to the different procedures. Of utmost importance are, of course, the medical papyri, of which two are at least partly of a surgical nature. If we start with the Edwin Smith papyrus, the preserved copy is dated to the New Kingdom around 1300 BC, but it is possible that this work originated in an earlier period. The 48 cases uh, are divided in title, examination, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, and in several cases a vocabulary with explanation. 
For each case, it is decided whether it is a condition to treat, to contend, or not to treat due to poor prognosis. The cases are arranged in a systematic manner, beginning with the skull and progressing downwards. For some unknown reason, the scribe has stopped in the middle of the text, in the middle of a case, in the middle of a word. It seems natural that the original manuscript would have continued all the way down to the feet. But unfortunately, we have no case involving the pelvic area or the lower extremities. Almost all cases are of a traumatic nature and wounds are most common. These were normally treated with bandages, initially with fresh meat and later with oil and honey. Two different techniques for closing of wounds are mentioned. They could be uh, closed by strips of linen and it seems natural that it is here a question of adhesive strips such as were used in the mummies. The other technique was suturing. Sutures performed as part of the mummification process have also been preserved to our times. Many of the cases are of an orthopedic nature, with several fractures. The ancient Egyptians did certainly treat fractures of various kinds and with various success. Two graves from the 5th dynasty have also been found in Nagadir with preserved wooden splints in situ where the patients have apparently succumbed due to open fractures. The splints seem to have been of an efficient design concerning the fracture of the forearm, while the same cannot be said regarding the fracture of the femur. A number of dislocations are also mentioned, such as reduction of a dislocated jaw. One of the few possibly non-traumatic cases in this papyrus is case 39, an abscess treated with a fire drill. The use of this is not described in any detail, but perhaps one might assume that it was used in order to per perforate the abscess. The papyrus Ebers is dated to around 1534 BC. The manuscript is a compilation assembled from several different sources and it lacks the structure and comprehensiveness that is characteristic for the Edwin Smith papyrus. For the present topic, only the la last part of the papyrus, treating surgical conditions, is of interest. The Ebert papyrus presents surgical procedures of a more elective nature than the Edwin Smith papyrus. However, it should be noted that even though the Edmund Smith papyrus is known as the surgical papyrus, this refers more to the diagnosis than to the treatments, which cannot be said to be of a more surgical nature than those presented in the Ebers papyrus. Here we meet a number of superficial tumors of various origin, some of which seem to be of an infectious or vascular nature. Many of these are suggested to be treated with an operation, but in most cases no details are provided regarding the procedure. The following description is among the most detailed and seems to be describing the removal of an atheroma. If thou examinest a matter swelling in any limb of a man, and thou findest that its top projects and that it is joined and hemispherical, then thou shalt say concerning it, it is a swelling of matter that runs in his body. It is a disease which I will treat by an operation. There is something in it like viscous humor, and afterwards something like wax comes out. It forms a pouch. If anything remains in its pouch, it will return. Guinea worms have been found in the mummy material, and an operation for this condition seems to be described. The use of cautery for hemostasis is mentioned, and it is also suggested for what seems to be hernia and achites. A few have suggested that this might be a case of open surgery for hernia, but the text seems to suggest that it is a case of application of heat to the skin over the hernia which was believed to act through some to us unclear mechanism. This would be in accordance with a number of different procedures in historical times performed on the surface of the body with the intent of acting on a deeper level, 
such as cupping, scarring and also cautery. The treatment suggested for arthritis is likely to be of a similar superficial nature. It has been suggested that the treatment consisted in creating a, a channel for drainage of the fluid, similarly to the procedure later described by Celsius. Considering the general level of surgery, this seems very unlikely, but the suggestion is not inconsistent with the text itself. There is further a case of an oozing swelling of the male genitals. This has sometimes been interpreted as a hydrocele, but it seems hardly to be conclusive from the text. So, based on the written sources, it is clear that the surgical procedures in Egypt included wound treatment including suturing and hemostasis, surgery on superficial tumors and abscesses and such, reposition of luxations and fractures. Let us now continue with other procedures. Reduction of dislocated limbs are never mentioned in the literary sources. It seems, however, to be commonly accepted that the first evidence regarding reduction of dislocated shoulder dates back to ancient Egypt, normally specified as a depiction in the tomb of Ipfi. This is also used as an emblem for the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. The scene is found in the tomb of the building master Ippi and is showing a construction site. In the scene, several persons are at work building a catafalc. The popularity of this hypothesis is partly based on the reduction scene being interpreted as one of three industrial accidents occurring at this workplace. The other accidents would be represented by the person on the upper left side who seems to have dropped his hammer on his foot and below him a person who might be having a foreign body removed from his eye. It seems however more likely to be an administration of eye ointment or simply the application of traditional eye paint. The evidence is thus not compelling. Concerning the reduction scene itself, it demonstrates some similarities with the reduction method of kosher. However, while the scene is compatible with this interpretation, it can hardly be said to be so specific as to make this more than a possibility. Davy's suggestion that we are simply seeing a man trying to awake one of his fellow workers who is taking a nap seems at least equally plausible. Concerning amputations, the general level of Egyptian surgery makes it unlikely that limb amputations were common, even if it is likely that they might have been performed under extraordinary circumstances. As Kirk put it, it seems probable that instinctive limb dismemberment took place in prehistoric times, either for dry gangrene, for limb entrapment, or to dispose of crushed and virtually amputated limbs in the presence of open fractures, making use of fracture site or cutting through joints, especially those of the fingers and toes. Thus, when we meet amputation in the osteological material, they should be interpreted with caution. And as Maino has pointed out regarding prehistorical times, Lions were more common than surgeons in those days. From the modern literature, it is often possible to get the impression that limb amputations were commonly performed. Perhaps the most important contribution to the perception of amputations as an Egyptian therapeutic procedure comes from none other than the famous surgeon of Napoleon, Larey. In his memoirs of the Egyptian campaign, he wrote appreciating about the surgical skills of the ancient Egyptians, and provided the following information from his visit to Thebes. On the ceilings and walls of these temples are bas reliefs representing limbs cut off with instruments very similar to those used at present in surgery for amputating. Instruments of the same kind are described in their hieroglyphics, and traces are discovered of surgical operations, which prove that there is surgery kept pace with other arts, 
which appear to have been carried to a high degree of perfection. Unfortunately, no depiction of amputations are known from Thebes. Larey has simply misinterpreted the depictions and hieroglyphs, taking them at face value, and this is perhaps an understandable mistake considering their appearance as seen in these examples. Recently, El Gindi published another depiction provided to him by the Egyptologist Sawi Hawass. This was stated to be depicting an amputation of the upper extremity. The published photo is of poor quality and somewhat difficult to interpret. It seems to be depicting a man holding the ends of a thin thread in each hand, while the thread is curved around another man's lower arm or arms. Considering that a wire saw was introduced in surgery as late as 1894, it does seem safe to discard this suggestion. The origin of the photo was not specified in more detail than that it came from an ancient temple. It seems, however, that this photo stems not from a temple, but from the tomb of Keti in Bene Hassan, as seen in this drawing. If we look at the context, it is part of a scene of young boys playing different games. Among other games, we can here see a boy standing on his head, two boys playing with a ring and two sticks, etc. While the suggested amputation scene in the upper right corner seems more readily interpreted as a string game. We also have some procedures not belonging to the field of surgery. Female circumcision is well known from modern Egypt, where it is still being performed. In the medical literature it is often said that this practice originated in ancient Egypt, and it has occasionally been claimed that this has been confirmed from mummy studies. We have, however, no clear evidence suggesting female circumcision from pharaonic times. There are no circumcised mummies, and the only suggestion of this procedure is a magic inscription on the coffin uh, from on one coffin from the Middle Kingdom, where a substance from an uncircumcised virgin is mentioned. The procedure is mentioned in later Greek and Roman sources, suggesting it to be a common practice. The procedure described by them is clitoridectomy, rather than a more extensive form known under the name of pharaonic circumcision. We have no means of deciding which form of female circumcision that was performed in Egypt, neither can we decide how common this practice might have been during the various epochs, and as for male circumcision, this procedure has little to do with surgery. Regarding male circumcision, this originated according to Herodotus in Egypt or possibly in Ethiopia. This practice is well documented in text mummies, sculptures, and in these two well-known depictions. Such genital procedures had little to do with surgery, and there is nothing in the sources connecting this procedure with the doctors. The circumcisers appear to belong to the priestly caste. If we now continue with non-existent surgery, that is, surgical procedures which have by some modern authors been attributed to the Egyptians, but where there are nothing in the sources supporting this, then we can stay in the lower regions. It has sometimes been claimed that the Egyptians performed castration. The most important source behind this is Theodore Siculus from the 1st century BC. He refers to a now lost depiction in the mortuary temple of Ramses II with captives of war without hands and privy members. Based on similar surviving scenes, such as those in the nearby temple of Ramses III, it is, however, evident that these procedures were performed on dead enemies as a way of counting bodies. This is also supported by the associated inscriptions. Pharaoh Menemptah's mummy was found with the scrotum removed. This has been suggested to be the result of a surgical procedure, but it was evident from the fresh wound that this was done shortly before death, or more likely after death. 
The most simple explanation is of course that the scrotum was inadvertently avulsed during the mummification. And a similar explanation is of course most likely concerning the avulsed penis of Nectank. It has been suggested that lithotomies were performed by the ancient Egyptians, not only by cutting of the stone, but also by urethral dilatation uh, with extraction and the latter procedure is sometimes described in surprising detail. This is unfortunately a pure uh, myth which has been propagated through the scientific literature. There is nothing in the original sources which is even remotely connected to the cutting of the stone or urethral dilatation with extraction. When following the references, it seems as if this myth has been caused by a careless reading of uh, Willis' book on the treatment of stone in the bladder from 1842. He is indeed mentioning these details in relation to Egypt, but he is referring to the observations made by Prospero Alpini during his voyage in Egypt in the 1580s and published in his Medicina Egyptiorum from 1591. There are a number of other procedures which likewise without any support in the original sources have at times been attributed to the Egyptians. Concerning bloodletting, caesarean section and mastectomy, the modern authors never discuss this in any detail or provide any relevant references, and it is likely that they are simply mixing up the pharaonic era with practices described in the Greco-Roman world, while I will not discuss this further. There are however a number of other procedures which need to be discussed in more detail. Trepanations have been performed since Neolithic times and have been surprisingly common around the world. The notion that trepanations were common in ancient Egypt is widespread, not least among newer surgeons. In reality, we do not have one clear example of a trepine skull from the pharaonic era. Holes in the head are common, but this was part of the mummification process. And the reason why this misconception is so common is partly due to this popular novel of Sinve, The Royal Trepanner by Mika Valtari. This book was translated into 40 different languages and even ended up on the Hollywood screen and seems to have left a lasting impression. The other reason is due to a lack of understanding among doctors writing about the history of trepanations. Here we have a depiction from the tomb of Keti in Beni Hassan. This was in 1837 interpreted as a doctor treating a patient. In 1919 as a barber surgeon performing some kind of operation. In 22 it was a probable trepanation, in 67 it was a trepanation and in 84 you could even see the trepan. And in 2002 El Gindi interpreted as a surgeon performing a cranial surgery. But no one bothered to read the hieroglyphs above the image which clearly states that this is a case of shaving of the head. In his paper in New Surgery, El Gindi published this image which had been provided by Sawi Hawass. It was said to come from an unnamed Egyptian temple and to depict a New Surgical operation and it has later been used on the web page of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. However, it is evident that this is a scene from the tomb of Usherhat. The scene is known as the barber scene, with two barbers shaving the head of Egyptian soldiers. The alternative explanation, that two surgeons are performing trepanations while a number of patients are waiting in line in order to get the trepanation does not seem convincing. Not every depiction of a man touching the head of another man can be interpreted as a neurosurgical operation. Shaving, cutting of hair, washing, anointment and massage are likely to have been more common in ancient Egypt than neurosurgery. Similarly, there is a tendency, especially among newer surgeons, to interpret every hole in the head as a trepanation. 
In reality, some are pseudo-pathological changes that have occurred after death, others are due to pathological changes. The case most often referred to regarding trepanations in Egypt is the skull from the 12th dynasty found in the pit at Lisht. The fame of this skull is partly due to the fact that it was mentioned in the translation of the Edwin Smith papyrus. It has, however, since a long time been identified as a symmetrical biparietal bone resorption, a well-known and rather common condition. Other cases are of traumatic origin. The skull of Horsnes Maritamen might be a case of trepanation, but I would guess that we are dealing with a traumatic injury. There is not one single case of a clearly trepanned skull from ancient Egypt, like those found in South America and other parts of the world. Clearly trepanned skulls have been found in Egypt, but none of these can be identified as belonging to the Pharaonic era, but belongs instead to the Greek, Roman or even to the Byzantine periods. As Leka wrote regarding one of the more well-known skulls, Si une femme étrangère découvert dans une nécropole chrétienne à une époque où l'Égypte était annexée par Rome. If trepanations existed in ancient Egypt, they must have been extremely rare. The existence of dentists in ancient Egypt is documented and several recipes exist concerning dental conditions. However, no indications of dental surgery are found in the medical papyri or in the visual arts. Regarding the osteological material, the possible indications of dental surgery are few and weak. There is not a single example of a clear tooth extraction, nor of a filling or of an artificial tooth. The suggested examples of evacuation of apical abscesses can be more readily explained as outflow sinuses. Regarding the suggested bridges, these are constituted of one find likely dating to the Old Kingdom and one likely dating to the Ptolemaic era. Both of these seem to be too weak to have served any possible practical purpose in a living patient, and the most likely explanation would be to consider them as a restoration performed during the mummification process. It has surprisingly often been stated that already the ancient Egyptians performed tracheostomies. An analysis of this claim demonstrated to be founded only on two depictions from the proto-dynastic era, 31st uh, century BC. The slabs of Pharaoh Aha and of Jir. These depictions are, as seen here, difficult to reconcile with the tracheostomy from an anatomical point of view. The text can be interpreted as receiving captives of the south and north. The man towards which the knife is directed is, is, is here clearly seen in the conventional pose of a captive with the arms supposedly tied behind his back. Further, it is well known that human sacrifices existed under Aha and reached its peak under Jir, whose tomb complex in Abydos contained 590 subsidiary graves. Ophthalmology was one of the most important specialties in the Egyptian medicine, and more specialists in this field are known than from any other field. This specialization seems, however, to have been of a purely non-invasive nature. It has been claimed that cataract surgery was performed in Pharaonic Egypt, based on two sources. The source is sometimes given as Herodotus, who is said to have provided even the name of the inventor of the procedure, as well as many other details of the procedure. This is, of course, pure nonsense, and this cannot be found in the writing of Herodotus. It is not easy to understand how this misconception came into being, and it took me a lot of detective work to find the source, which was the famous Egyptologist George Ebers. He was not only one of the most important persons concerning the history of medicine in Egypt, giving his name to the largest of the medical papyri, but also a writer of popular novels. One of these novels, Eine Ägyptische Königstochter from 1864, 
reached widespread popularity and was translated into several languages. Here the above-mentioned details are found and have evidently later made their way from the world of fiction to the world of science. The more commonly source referred to is the previously described scene in the tomb of Ipvi. Here one person is holding an instrument to the eye of another person. The instrument is very large and shows no resemblance to the needles used in other times and areas for this procedure. Even if we were to accept that the depiction is a crude attempt by an artist with limited understanding of the procedure, the settings of the scene demonstrates that we can safely disregard the cataract hypothesis. The scene is showing a construction site and it seems strange that one of the workers suddenly decides to have a cataract surgery performed while he is still continuing with his work. The scene regarding the eye is compatible with the suggestion that it is a case of removal of a foreign body from the eye. It is possible that we are actually seeing the cause of this uh, foreign body in form of the worker chiseling above the patient. But it is even more likely that we are simply seeing the application of traditional eye paint. And with that we have reached the end of this presentation. It is clear that the modern literature has sometimes been too enthusiastic regarding the surgical skills it has attributed to the ancient Egyptians, and this has created a fog for which it is difficult to discern their true surgical achievements. Even if the surgery of this period consisted of the most basic procedures and might seem modest in relation to what would later be achieved in Alexandria and other parts of the Greek and Roman world, it was a first step and must thus be considered a major achievement. And with this I thank you for your attention.